Good day, class. Let's go ahead and pick up where we left off last class, but I do want to go back and talk a little bit more about one of the images that I didn't have a chance to talk about last time under the functions of the cortex when we're looking at sensory functions. So here we talk about seeing without eyes. This fMRI, functional MRI scan, shows a research participant with closed eyes who had been given a placebo. And again, a placebo is something that uh, does not have a real active ingredient in it. It does not really have an effect on us. And B, in this fMRI, the same person is under the influence of LSD. Uh, the color represents increased blood flow here. The psychoactive drug LSD, which we'll talk about more in a future chapter, often produces vivid hallucinations. Why is the question. It dramatically increases, and the answer to that is it dramatically increases communication between the visual cortex and the occipital lobe and other brain regions. So you can see in, in image B that there's a lot more color going on there uh, associated with other brain regions as opposed to what we see in the A image. The B image is basically saying all of a sudden while on this drug, it taps into other regions of the brain all over. And that could explain why we have a lot of these vivid hallucinations while on this particular drug. Okay, now let's talk about other functions of the cortex, in particular the association areas. Association areas are cerebral cortex areas not involved in primary motor or sensory functions, meaning that we have not identified anything specifically that it does, this area of the brain does, when it comes to a primary motor or sensory function. They are, however, involved in higher mental functions, such as learning, remembering, thinking, and speaking. These association areas are found in all four lobes. The prefrontal cortex enables judgment, planning, social interactions, and new memory processing, can alter personality and inhibitions when damaged, disconnects moral behavior from behavior. So the notion is, if we remember Phineas Gage from an earlier chapter, that when his part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, was damaged, his personality changed drastically. And so we can see why that would be. The parietal lobes enable math and spatial reasoning. The right temporal lobe underside enables face recognition. So these association areas are not seen to do anything specifically when it comes to primary motor or sensory functions, but they do seem to be important. Complex mental functions don't reside in any one place. During a complex task, a brain scan shows many islands of brain activity working together, some running automatically in the background and others under conscious control. Your memory, language, and attention result from functional connectivity, that is, communication among distinct brain areas and neural networks. Ditto for religious experience. More than 40 distinct brain regions become active in different religious states, such as prayer and meditation, indicating that there is no simple God spot, so to speak. The point to remember is the following. Our mental experiences arise from coordinated brain activity. Now, let's talk about responses to damage. Now, unfortunately, fortunately, we can go through life, hopefully, without having any significant type of brain damage. But that's not the case for everyone, for a whole variety of reasons. Riding a bicycle and falling off, uh, having a car accident, or whatever the case may be, or some other uh, defect or abnormality. Attributions for many brain damage effects. Severed brain and spinal cord neurons do not regenerate. Specific areas are pre-assigned for some brain functions. But there is neuroplasticity in reorganization. They may occur after serious damage, especially in young children. So when you have someone who's rather young and they have some sort of damage to the brain, there's a greater likelihood that there will be some reorganization or neuroplasticity as a result, which meaning 
the brain will find a new way to do what it has just lost, to process something, to, to have a workaround. Again, be sure to watch the video on plasticity uh, in your Canvas uh, site. It will demonstrate uh, what some of the powerful things are when it comes to plasticity in the young, with a young lady whose who's half her brain has been removed, but yet within weeks she's able to walk out of the hospital. So in neuroplasticity, after a serious damage, especially in young children, this can occur. It makes unused brain areas available for other uses. For example, in case of blindness or deafness or damage to one hemisphere. So if you are someone who is blind and you're not using your occipital lobe to process visual information, it is possible that that brain space could be used for some other function. And then we have the idea of neurogenesis. New neurons may be produced to migrate elsewhere and form connections. So the idea is that the brain does have some plasticity. It can recuperate. It can build new. It can work around to figure out ways to accomplish certain tasks. Now let's talk about the divided brain or the split brain. So Splitting the brain. The corpus callosum is where the left and right hemispheres of the brain connect. It is like the uh, internet cable and telephone wiring for right hemisphere to left hemisphere and vice versa. It is the only place within our skull where we have internal communication between the, light, the, the left hemisphere of the brain and the right hemisphere of the brain. Now, a couple other things. Sometimes we have seizures, epileptic seizures, seizures caused by other types of things. And normally what will happen is the seizure will start in one hemisphere of the brain and then migrate to the other hemisphere of the brain causing damage there. The reason it can migrate to the other hemisphere of the brain is because of the corpus callosum. It is the bridge. It is the connection. So basically what they do sometimes to try to combat these horrible seizures that can damage the brain and spread to the other hemisphere of the brain is to sever the communication between the brain directly by severing the corpus callosum. So basically when the corpus callosum is severed, we saw that for some the seizures disappeared, personality and intellect remained largely intact, Visual information sharing, however, ended. Behavior and agency were affected or influenced. The left hemisphere gives rational goal-related orders. The right hemisphere gives conflicting demands. So let me give you an example of what we're talking about here. Let's pay attention to the graph uh, on the right here. So we have the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere is the one that says optic chiasm. And the left one says speech over there. Now remember about this whole idea of the crossover that happens at the brain stem. So that things that we control our right side with our left brain, we control our left side of our body with our right brain. The same thing goes for certain unique aspects of the left and right brain. So we see the person here, we're looking at their brain from the top, they are shown into the left visual field a pencil and shown in the right visual field an apple. So basically the person is sitting at a table and they're staring, let's say, at an X in the middle. And then they flash the right visual field and the left visual field, the items I just described. So what this basically means is shown in the right visual field, that item, the apple, goes to the left hemisphere. So the left brain sees the apple. Now, the right brain sees what's in the left visual field. The right brain sees the pencil. If you ask this person, what is it that you see, what they will report is apple. That's all they're able to report. Because speech is primarily located in the left hemisphere. It is the only brain of the two here that can speak. So when it can respond to a question, it's going to be the left brain responding. What do you see? I see an apple. 
as far as the left brain is concerned, there is no pencil because that brain did not see a pencil. But if you go to the right brain, okay, and you cannot ask them what it is that they see because they don't have speech capability in the right brain. But what you can do, however, is give them a pen, put it in their left hand, and tell them to draw what it is that they have just observed. They will draw something looking very much like a pen or pencil. Then when they look down at it, including the uh, left brain looking down at it as well, they'll be able to say pencil. But the idea here is this. Because of the severing of the corpus callosum, the internal communication capability between the left brain and right brain is gone. The only communication now is possible outside the person. So in a way, you have two distinct consciousness going on here. One consciousness is aware of the apple, but not the pencil. The other consciousness is aware of the pencil and not the apple. But because most of us have an intact corpus callosum, we are aware of them both. So what we have here in essence is one skull, two minds. You can read this in your textbook to see how this actually works with the heart uh, example here. But the idea is very simple. The idea is basically communicating the notion that what we have is basically two minds and one body by severing the corpus callosum.